what I would like to do first is to discuss this term. So the term absolute music refers to music that doesn't have a literary orientation. So it doesn't have a descriptive title, and it's used to describe music that's abstract. to the term programmatic, which refers to music that does have descriptive titles and does tell a story. So, So in general, absolute music is associated with the classical period, and programmatic music is associated with the romantic period. There are composers who write absolute music during the romantic era, but in general, those composers are viewed as more conservative, more influenced by Viennese classicism, such as Brahms. So when we talk about Brahms, we'll talk about the idea of Brahms being described as a neoclassicist. So the form that arose that is the most important form associated with absolute music in the classical period is sonata allegro form. So this sideways so you can write a long ways across. First thing to do is to write at the top the three main sections. So there are three sections. places. Okay, the first section then indicate the four spots where you have passages or you know sections that you label. And also then indicate the key that's associated with those places.
So what's the name of the first section? Exposition. And what are those four places that you label in the exposition? A theme. A theme. The transition. The transition. B theme. B theme. B theme. And, closing theme. and closing theme. What keys? If it's in a major key, A theme would be in tonic. And then transition would modulate to dominant and cadence and dominant. So you typically wait until the cadence occurs, and then what follows that cadence in the second key is that B theme, the second main theme. What is the nature of that theme typically? If it's a fast movement, that B theme would typically be more, more lyrical, right? So maybe more sustained, more stepwise. Those are all vocal characteristics. And then what follows the B theme? Final section, it's called? Closing section. section, right. A lot of times that'll be real brilliant. You know, we're gonna hear that in, in the Mozart example in a minute. Okay, and what about double bars and repeats? That goes around exposition. exposition. So for sure in a classical symphony, you expect to see that. All right. Underneath the second section, then, indicate what happens melodically and harmonically. So what are things that you're looking for in terms of thematic elements and then harmonic elements? Then what's the label for the final passage in the development before the, the last section, before the third section of the form? Retransition. Right. And so indicate the harmony with that. We didn't talk about the keys that you expect if it's in a minor key in the exposition. What are the two keys? Obviously tonic for the A theme, but then transition, cadence, and relative major. One thing that you might put in your notes is that um, a second possibility, and it's not nearly as often, um, but in a minor key, you could have the second theme being in minor dominant. So you might make a little note about that. Um, so if a composer wants to keep both themes in the minor mode, then that's more often than not what will happen is that that second theme will be in the minor dominant, not major dominant, but just that diatonic minor. So if you're in the key of C minor, that would be G minor. All right, then indicate what happens in the final section. So the name of the final section is Recapitulation, good. And basically, the recap does what? Brings states brings back all the themes from the exposition, only now the difference harmonically is that they're all in tonic, right? So you don't have a modulation in the second key. So in a big symphony, like some of these mature, later Mozart symphonies, Haydn symphonies, the first movement could start with an introduction, so that's optional. It's not one of the you know, principal sections. But In these bigger works, 
um, that have an introduction, they usually serve to provide a sense of contrast to the rest of the movement. And the way that they'll do this is with a contrasting tempo. So very often it'll be an adagio introduction. And very often they'll focus on the opposite mode. So in general, composers in the classical period wrote far more works that were in major keys than in minor keys. So Mozart's 41 symphonies, only two are in minor keys. They both happen to be in G minor. One of his most famous is number 40 in G minor. Um, but same kind of thing with uh, Haydn. And so um, very often, these introductions would really focus around the minor mode. And then when the exposition began with the A theme, then it was changed to major, and then that begins. So we'll put here a forms contrast, often forms contrast. That's a brief concluding codetta or, or coda. And we're going to see with Beethoven that Beethoven really expands the length of his coda sections to the point that they often serve like second development sections. So that might be something that you would include in your chart. Okay, so be um, thinking about this form, and we're going to see many, many different examples of this. Okay, one of the things that classical composers do in comparison to Baroque composers um, has to do with the orchestration techniques. The Baroque style we'll study um, in the next section. Basically, we'll just present one orchestral color and continuously develop that. So you don't have a lot of contrasting timbre. So this term timbre refers to the color, the particular sound of, that distinguishes a clarinet from a flute or a violin from a piano. So that general term timbre refers to that. that's described as changing points of color. So that from one moment to the next, composers would write for different combinations of instruments. So there's a lot of contrast of tamper within a movement. And that's one of the features that distinguishes a Baroque style from a classical style.
So this is one element that's different from the Baroque style, which we'll talk about this term, theory of affections, of presenting one color or one mood per movement. And the whole movement would be unified around that emotion, that one emotion. So classicism has contrasting emotions. So more animated or aggressive A themes versus more lyrical B themes and more change of the timbre from one moment to the next in the work. So, first composer that we're going to look at is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who is one of the most famous composers in Western European history. know the dates of Mozart's life. So I went through that in the first class. How old was Mozart when he died? 35. So he lived a very short life. And he is regarded um, as possibly the greatest child genius of, of all time. Um, by the time he was five years old, he was already composing. He played keyboard instruments. He was a violinist. He and his sister were described as being Wunderkind, which is a wonder child. And they were taken on tours by their father to the courts in Europe. And so they were internationally famous as children. Mozart is someone who's described as having a sense of absolute musicality and that he could compose music in the same way that we write a letter. And he had the ability to think things out to the point that when he would notate them, he could carry on a conversation with someone as he was writing out and you know, his, his, uh, his works. So, Mozart was in this situation where he didn't have a normal childhood. And he had a very um, unique relationship with his father. It was very domineering. And um, Mozart was born in Salzburg, Austria, which is the town of Mozart. Now, if you go to Salzburg, that's Mozart. Memorabilia everywhere. So, did you go to Salzburg this summer? Yeah. And so that was relatively provincial in comparison to Vienna. Um, his father, who was very important um, musician, was the Kapellmeister for the Archbishop of Salzburg, whose name was Colorado. And it was a very secure position. And Mozart could have continued in this position that uh, he would have inherited from his father, but he really couldn't stand this archbishop. And he also wanted to be in a more cosmopolitan area. You know, so he moved to Vienna in 1781 and spent the last 10 years of his life in Vienna. Really opposed to. Um, it's really interesting to read Mozart's letters. You can 